Okay, so we can start. It's 11.15. Uh, I hope you are enjoying the conference so far. Uh, my name is Miroslav Franz, I, or Mirek Franz for short. I work at the Carnel Core team, and I prepared a presentation about uh, SECOMP. Uh, and uh, maybe a tiny bit about Vulgar internal, but you will see later. Uh, I'm not uh, like, uh, I don't have any upstream contribution to SECOM whatsoever, but uh, I was at some point tasked to look into it so that we can like back purchases uh, and stuff. Uh, and I found some interesting uh, things about it. So I want to share today, you know. Uh, now, this is kind of, this slide is kind of a teaser. Uh, you all know the utility file, you know. Uh, I presume, you know, it's uh, basically the thing that uh, you give as an argument some file and it will read the uh, contents of the file and based on some magic bytes, it tries to guess what the file contains, you know. If you run this under Valgrind, you know, try to debug it under Valgrind, it will print you something like this currently, you know. And uh, at, at the end of this presentation, you should understand more uh, why this, this is happening. Uh, the second line, it tells you something like unhandled uh, syscall 317. Syscall 317 is actually seccomp. And uh, so let's talk about seccomp. Uh, the seccomp uh, stands uh, short for uh, secure computing. It has uh, like nothing to do with uh, confidential computing or secure execution or secure boot. So if you are in uh, for this, you are in the wrong room. You know? <laughs> I just want to <laughs> I just want to mention that. You know? uh, second, it basically feature of Linux kernel uh, that is uh, meant uh, to implement a kind of software engineering pattern that is actually sandboxing. You know, there are uh, like many ways to do sandboxing, uh, but uh, second is uh, only. Uh, one one way to do it, you know. We all know that we should uh, write secret software or write code in Rust or I don't know what else, uh, and then uh, our software will be like secure and there will be no exploits. In, uh, in reality, we will always have uh, vulnerabilities and we will always have exploits and we will always handle untrusted data or have uh, containers. So, Secomp is. Uh, one way to to implement sandboxing, and it's only a tiny part of sandboxing. It's actually like uh, filtering syscalls. Syscalls, like the requests you make to the Linux kernel, either uh, the syscalls themselves or their arguments. Uh, I'll show you at later slides. Seccom these days is like uh, ubiquitous. It, uh, it's in the browsers, you know, Firefox, Chromium, emulators. Uh, containers, uh, you know, Android, you know, file utility uses it, at least on some architectures. <laughs> so uh, let's uh, go about how it works, you know. This is the example from the, from the teaser, it was actually happening. Um, uh, the user bin file uh, is uh, like the utility, and it tries to protect itself against SecCom because it's a uh, you fetch some data from uh, from the internet, and you run a file on it, and uh, like uh, to figure out what it is, you know. But uh, that data could have some exploit in it, and uh, if your file is kind of vulnerable, it has some overflows or whatever, uh, the attacker could potentially hijack the execution of user bin file and uh, cause some issues. So what, uh, how file protects itself, it tries to sandbox itself a bit, you know. It uh, does a request uh, at the very beginning before like uh, processing any data. It uh, does a request to the kernel. It calls second syscall and it says, for example, uh, I, in the future, I don't want to call ptrace, you know. It's just an example, it does it for more syscalls, but ptrace is just another syscall. And uh, it's a Cisco file probably doesn't need. So it just uh, promises kernel, you know, I don't want to do ptrace. Uh, kernel says, OK. And if uh, at some point in the future read some data and some exploit would try to, it would hijack the file execution and it would uh, call ptrace, uh, kernel would say, oh, but uh, this process promised me 
that they won't call pit race, and now it's calling pit race, so let's just kill it. No, uh, and uh, this is like uh, how in principle second works. Uh, you don't have to check for, uh, you can also check uh, for uh, specific arguments, you know. Uh, now a bit about the uh, SECOM history. Like uh, SECOM uh, is a kernel feature uh, that uh, dates back to uh, 2005 for kernel 2.6.12. And uh, it was, I think, Ar Andrea Arcangeli who, who introduced it into kernel. And uh, like the history is kind of, uh, it goes to kernel uh, 5. But uh, I'm not gonna go through over it. You can read it later if you want. But what is important is originally there was uh, Secom had uh, introduced uh, some strict mode, you know, and it was uh, very simple. Uh, the first version uh, it had it was basically only boolean flag. You could uh, turn it on, on. That's only you could do. You could uh, turn uh, Secom strict mode on. And from that moment on, the only things you could do was, was uh, execute those four syscalls. Read, write, exec, and sig return. Um, of course, this is very limiting. Uh, on top of that, this is like a first like, problem of second, you know, because if you are like uh, uh, some user space developer, you don't always have a control which like uh, syscalls are executing. That actually happened uh, that uh, glibc at some point started calling exit group for each, every process, you know, as a result, even if you have empty main and you enable kind of strict mode uh, uh, in it, not, so it's not empty, uh, when you, uh, when you like return from main, uh, glibc will call exit group and uh, strict mode will kill it. So it's kind of useless these days, I guess. Uh, in uh, 2012, kernel 3.5, uh, second filter mode was introduced, and that basically uh, adds the ability to specify like which syscalls and which uh, or which of the arguments we care about and decide what action should be taken. Uh, this is specified uh, via additional argument that is pa passed to second syscall and. Uh, that argument uh, is basically pointer to the CBPF program. It's not to be confused with eBPF. It's the original like BPF version. I will talk about it later. Uh, so uh, you basically decide like uh, which uh, which syscall, which arguments should be like uh, uh, ban listed and uh, pass it to the second and kernel will take care of that. So strict mode, filter mode. In kernel 5, 2019, uh, something like a notification is introduced. This is basically mostly used for uh, containers, where uh, you have a container and uh, uh, what you do is that uh, your, your container, at the very beginning, uh, like uh, install secomp and get some descriptor and, and hands over the descriptor to, to some other uh, like uh, supervising agent that uh, can be notified when this container does something. So it, it kind of, uh, these are like a three major like versions of SECOMP. And uh, yeah, well, let, let's, go, let's go further, C, CBPF. Um, uh, it's not eBPF, as I mentioned, it's uh, like the original implementation that was uh, made for BSD packet <laughs> filter. It, uh, it's as almost old, as, as, as the kernel itself, it's from 1992. Uh, it's a kind of uh, kind of bytecode. It's a simple instruction set. It has only two registers. Uh, the instructions are 64 bit long. You know, you can you can see here like uh, the 16 bit opcode. You know, uh, two jump offset and uh, some immediate field for for constants. It implements some uh, instructions. Uh, at the at the last uh, as the last, I have uh, an example that's kind of. Pseudo assembly. This is uh, not how you write uh, like BPF programs, you know. But it's just uh, as an illustration, you know, how how you would uh, conceptually uh, understand that. You know, you load a syscall number from some structure that is handed to you. Uh, you compare it with what you care about. In this case, like a, a p trace, like syscall number. 
And if it's equal, you jump at uh, L1, otherwise you jump at L2, you know. So if you call P-trace, uh, you, you get killed, uh, otherwise you are allowed. Um, this is like how you install this kind of, uh, this slide is kind of hello world of the uh, seccomp, you know. This is like a minimal way how we would do it with just glibc headers. It doesn't have includes, but you can find them in manual page. Uh, first thing, like uh, this is like uh, the actual program, you know, this is like structure and uh, we, we don't write it in assembly, unfortunately, and there's no like compiler that targets BPF uh, 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 instructions. So you need to use like C macros to construct instructions. So in here, I'm, I'm actually fetching like uh, from second data the, uh, the uh, Cisco number, you know. Here on second instruction, I compare it uh, with, uh, with uh, ARM syscall. You know? If it's ARM syscall, I'm killing the process otherwise, or myself in this case, you know, uh, uh, otherwise I'm allowing everything else. Uh, then I figure out how big it is. Uh, this is like important. I need to promise kernel I won't, I won't be gaining any new privileges, so I won't uh, escape uh, kind of the, the sandboxing. Otherwise, the, uh, if I didn't do this, the second syscall would fail now. Uh, I wouldn't be able to install the filter. So I need to promise the kernel first this. And then I install the filter. This is like pointer to the program, to the filter. And from that moment on, you know, if I call sick alarm, you know, like uh, in here uh, where the command is, then I will be killed. This is like a basic principle how it works. Of course, I, I need to mention two things at this slide. Uh, one is uh, like a, it kind of, uh, this uh, slide is a bit incomplete, right? Because I should uh, probably first check the architecture. This is also part of the data that second filter is available because the Cisco number, you know, this an error, this, uh, this is a like relative to architecture and you might have like, a, uh, stacked architectures, you have x86-64 and uh, i386, right? And uh, SECOM has different version in 64-bit architecture and different version of 32-bit architecture. So this number is kind of meaningless. So I should, uh, in proper proper way, I should first check the architecture, the magic number for the architecture, then I should uh, check for the syscall. But for simplicity here, I skipped it. This is uh, basically how, how it works. and. But for user space programming, I really recommend to use libseccomp. Uh, that is a library that basically takes care of it so you don't have to write your own BPF programs. So. Now, I'm gonna switch tracks a bit and uh, tell you something about Valgrind, like what it is. Some of you, most of you probably know, uh, the simple way is uh, basically, well, it's not a very simple way, but the proper way would be to, to tell you that it's framework for uh, creating tools for dynamic binary analysis. Because there are actually very uh, many tools that the uh, you can use with Valgrind is dash dash tool equals and you can like uh, check for data races or profile or heap or whatever, you know. But most people use the default tool that is what uh, uh, what is on when you when you don't specify that is mem check, this is memory debugger, it checks uh, undefined uh, memory or like it inserts like so red zones around some buffers so that you can uh, detect overflows, underflows and so on. Uh, the, the, the important information on this slide is how it actually works. You know? it, uh, it has uh, uh, conceptually three stages. It's a decompiler, there's an instrumentation phase and there's like a JIT. You know? So you need first to take program you're analyzing with Valgrind you decompile it into some intermediate representation, you instrument that intermediate representation and you compile it back and you store that thing into some buffer, jump at it, start executing. But it has like, a, this is a, a extremely important because it means that basically Valgrin and the program that uh, Valgrin analyzes, they live in the same process. So if I run Valgrind on file, I have one process that is basically uh, recompiling file and uh, store, uh, executing file recompiled from some, from, some it's in, from its internal buffer. So Valgrind this way emulates the entire user land. Uh, so all the libraries included the glibc and whatnot. You, know? uh, you might ask yourself now, why do I have this uh, picture here? 
uh, some people call Valgrind a Valgrind or some, some other thing. It should actually be pronounced Valgrind because it's a, it's a name that predates English language. It's uh, from Norse mythology. Valgrind was one of the uh, 540 gates that led to Valhalla. You know? So <laughs> that's where the name come from. That picture probably doesn't uh, look like uh, it uh, leads to Valhalla, but uh, it's the best I could do. <laughs> Um, so, uh, back to the teaser slide, you know, what, what actually happened? I execute a Valgrind with file on something, you know, uh, and uh, Valgrind uh, tried to install second filter, but oops, uh, uh, Valgrind actually doesn't recognize the syscall, you know, the second syscall on AMD64 uh, or x86-64. It's uh, 317 or other architectures is something else, right? And the reason why I didn't recognize the syscall uh, was basically it's not implemented in Valgrin, and Valgrin must know like which syscalls, uh, uh, which syscalls it's actually passing to the kernel because that's the point where Valgrin loses control over the memory and over everything. So uh, we basically what we need to do. We need to tell the Valgrind uh, uh, how to handle some Cisco it doesn't know. Uh, this uh, and I, I, I did. I wrote a patch that uh, that uh, it works. Uh, this is not a patch because uh, the the second version is too complicated. Uh, this is from uh, uh, from some Valgrind developer documentation. Uh, it's just like uh, this is probably no longer relevant. I don't think. Uh, Linux has like time Cisco. Maybe it's it's uh, it's probably some virtual Cisco these uh, these days. So this example is probably like outdated, but it doesn't matter. It's just an uh, it's just an example. Uh, uh, what happens is time is the kind of the Cisco that returns some number, like number of seconds from first January of 1970. And if you pass it null pointer, it uh, writes the same thing into some uh, into some memory location. So uh, in the uh, Valgrind, I need to in, before I invoke the syscall, before I pass it to the kernel, I need to kind of uh, sanitize the input and outputs. I need to say like that I'm uh, that I'm reading from some register, and I need to check that, for example, that memory is actually I can write to that pointer. And when I return from the Cisco, I need to uh, like mark that uh, memory is uh, as initialized uh, and so on. And also, uh, this is for for Valgenders, for example, for memcheck to to be able to do its duties. So. Um, uh, another thing I need to do is to for every architecture. This is example from my actual Cisco patch from S390X. Uh, I need to uh, like uh, connect uh, those uh, those uh, uh, pre and post wrappers uh, to the second uh, Cisco number. Uh, there's there are these lin means Linux because second is only Linux. It doesn't work on FreeBSD or Solaris or whatever. Uh, and X and Y means X means pre wrapper and uh, Y means post wrapper. For example, rename at doesn't have post wrapper. Probably doesn't need it. But uh, second has a variant uh, where you actually uh, write to some memory, so you need a post wrapper. So these these are basically macros within Vulkan infrastructure that allows you to link your pre wrappers and post wrappers to the uh, to the actual number on 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 specific architecture. So now when uh, when I create a patch. I uh, run my modified Vulkan that now understands what second is, and. Uh, um, it's uh, it's for example here I'm uh, like a user bin file is banning get PID, you know. Uh, so Valgrind runs user bin file it bans get the PID. Now it's uh, Valgrind understand that it sanitizes uh, inputs it uh, passes it to the kernel kernel says okay, Valgrind sanitizes the outputs and the file is running uh, within Valgrind. But then uh, Valgrind not <coughs> not file because file promised not to call get PID doesn't need it. But uh, Valgrind for some reason needs it. Maybe it wants to create some temporary file with, with PID, whatever. It just calls get PID, uh, which is like syscall, and uh, it's banned uh, by, by the script that was installed by user bin file. And now 
Valgain is actually killed by Kernel. So we, we didn't help it much because we uh, treated uh, second syscall just like any other syscall, like a read, a write. But uh, second syscall is kind of different. It introduces this, uh, this uh, uh, sandboxing, and now the Valgain itself is sandboxed. And it cannot do its duties because it uh, obviously sometimes need to invoke syscall that original program didn't need to invoke. Now, what I'm, what I'm proposing we could do, uh, and I actually also did it uh, in, in, in the patch I wrote, uh, was uh, basically uh, within the pre-wrapper, no? within the wrapper that sanitizes inputs, we can just say, oh, we are trying to install uh, sandboxing. We could kind of fake it. We could say, uh, yes, seccomp, uh, uh, syscall, the, the filter installation, it succeeded. And uh, return, uh, market has succeeded, and file wouldn't, wouldn't know the difference, right? And then Valgain would run, and uh, later, when it would need to call get PID, it could, because it's not actually bound. Well, uh, this, uh, obviously, what it does is basically turning off uh, sandboxing dynamically. No. Uh, so this is how it looks like on the command line, it works. Now, what uh, this approach uh, actually, uh, what about it, you know? Like um, uh, some, some people have some security concerns, right? We are actually switching off uh, uh, like comp uh, dynamically, uh, but uh, I think it's more or less okay because it's not meant to run on production, you know? It's, uh, it's uh, for debugging purposes. And uh, the, the trouble is that uh, most, uh, some tools like uh, QMU allows you to provide sandboxing on and off. So you can actually turn in, uh, turn SECOMP uh, on and off dynamically. But some simple programs of, like file don't provide it. So we could actually provide it in Valgrind uh, so that we could uh, like uh, debug those tools uh, with Valgrind. Uh, and um, uh, because one of the biggest advantages of Vulgarin, say compared to sanitizers, is that you don't need to recompile everything, you know. And sometimes it's it's hard to recompile stuff, or it's not uh, wanted to recompile. You don't want to recompile stuff, you know? so sometimes you want to just uh, analyze what what was in the RPM. So I, I believe it it could be useful. But it cannot be like the default. You know, we cannot just uh, like disable sandboxing every time you run vulgar or something. So I think it should be hidden under under some option like second disable equals yes. You know. uh, what were actually the alternatives that could be? You know, I, I once mentioned it during lunch to one my former colleague of mine, and he said, "Why, why don't you do some something like this? You know, like allow list." We could potentially gather every like Cisco Vulgar needs and uh, build a BPF program that would allow it. You know? That would allow every one, uh, every each of one of those syscalls. and we could actually prepend this this BPF program to the program that's actually passed during uh, uh, a filter installation by by the program we are analyzing. So that uh, when that filter gets executed in the kernel, it would uh, like uh, allow list every every syscall vulgar needs, and then it would uh, it would like a uh, ban what uh, what uh, uh, what actually the, the program being analyzed ask us to ban. But that's actually not not that great, right? Because we we now have sort of sandboxing, but the sandboxing is not complete at all. And um, it's kind of non-transparent to the user. You no, know? I think like uh, having some clear uh, separation, like yes, we have sandboxing, but if uh, you insist, we can turn it off dynamically. Another thing would be actually to implement like SECOM completely within Valgrind, where we would have to write some uh, some BPF interpreter, like CBPF interpreter in Valgrind, and. Um, uh, we would do the, the, the sandboxing ourselves. You know, each, each time the program would uh, would invoke some syscall, we would in a pre-wrapper we would um, like uh, 
run that BPF program and check whether the, the program is allowed or not, you know. But uh, that probably is not a good idea at all because uh, they live in the same same thing. So if you if you like kind of exploit file, you exploit uh, Vulgan as well, you, or you might exploit Vulgan as well. Now kernel is better made for this purpose, so it's probably not a good good idea either, no. And that's basically end of my talk. I already see some people have questions and we are running out of time. So here are some things about SecComp, some URLs. If if you are interested, you can like click on it, read it. And uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, if you go back to the previous slide, so you, you had these two alternatives, but you pointed out there's libseccomp. So if you just uh, implement the libseccomp ABI in Wallgrind, it's probably a better abstraction then try to write a BPF interpreter. So they, 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 well, they, they, well, uh, you would handle uh, the uh, programs maybe, using libseccomp. I, I don't think, you know, uh, maybe, maybe you know it more than me, but I don't think libseccomp implements like BPF, right? Uh, it, it, uh, it just allows you to construct uh, BPF programs, but it's not an interpreter, you know? Interpreter is in, inside kernel. And uh, it's so, actually... So, so does libseccomp actually invoke the seccomp syscall and install the filter, or does it just yeah, write no, program it, it, and it, it, it involves a second syscall. It's just front end for, uh, I don't know where I have this. It's just front end uh, for this, you know, yeah. so you don't have to deal with this. You don't have to write your own BPF program. It does all this in the background. So we have nice, nice interface. You have like a so, bun this syscall, you know, and allow this syscall install filter, you know, like three lines instead of like doing this, uh, which is yeah. like a, a very user unfriendly even in the programming so, terms. So, so, so it should work to have Wallgrind emulate seccomp, but on the level of the libseccomp on, API and not on the kernel BPF level. Uh, and that should be it. Should be simpler because you don't need the BPF. I mean, where Wallgrind intercepts or every syscall already, and and you could have metadata representing what you what the program told libseccom, and apply that at that level with, you, without you, using BPF in any way. You you mean uh, like intercepting like uh, intercepting uh, libseccom? Uh, but what if you don't use libseccom? Well, then it doesn't work. But it, it probably works for ninety five percent. Mm -hmm. That, that, that might be an option, yeah, yeah. Uh, but isn't it that libseccomp is only at com for compile time? It, it eases compile time, uh, the compil compilation. So at runtime, you do need an, a BPF interpreter. In any case, if you want to, if you want to have come to the same conclusion as the kernel does. So when you told about the problem, the second solution was already what, what I thought about would be the right solution. But in the contents of Valgrind. Uh, you want it, don't want to kill the program like with any other memory violation. You want to say, okay, here's a, sec, uh, here's a, a seccom violation and continue to execute and add it to the list of problems you see with the program. So that would be my solution. And say, yes, don't kill, but keep going and have, an, have a BPF interpreter inside Valgrind. And yeah, but pretend so, to be like like with malloc and and yeah, that uh, was like the, the second solution, you know. So yeah, but then yeah. say here's a problem but, but, and keep going. But at the, at the end of the day, like uh, uh, the, the the reason we have like sandboxing, right? It's uh, like a uh, yeah, but Valgrind is not used in the security context; it's in the debugging context. If you know there's a problem, you put the pro uh, program to Valgrind and look where where is my problem. Uh, you will not run everything under uh, Valgrind for security yeah, reasons. So, in a if, if I understand it correctly, you basically want to use uh, Valgrind to debug like a second issues. No, but if there are, Valgrind is then uh, aware and just spits it out. And so, by the way, here's a second issue, may or may not be related, like it does with all the other stuff. Yeah, most likely it's easier to just uh, run it uh, without Vulcan and it's get killed and then you know you have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the continuing, it con what about... Uh, he, loves, he loves the violations. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's a lot losing the violation yeah. if you run it under Vulcan. That is true, you know, like... Um... Yeah, it goes in a similar direction as Torsten's question. So, I mean, you do that in a debugging environment. There you yeah. don't care about security. So... And you specifically now mentioned here Valgrind, so why don't you just patch out the seccomp call and be done with that? Because 
I mean, it should not make a difference for your memory safety issues that you try to debug. Like the only patch, thing is patch, that you uh, get patch second call to do what to the. Don't do it. I mean, you have the intermediate. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's, that's basically what I'm doing with, uh, with that. Uh, with that, uh, like. Uh, with that second disable, yeah. I'm doing it, you know, uh, but I'm but, just uh, ignoring it, yes. you know. So, uh, of course, we do get security bugs for debug tools, uh, like CVEs for Redelf. You're not using Redelf in production, but for debugging, you still get security bugs and about and that. You will so, so, you, so you debugging. will. Like when you get yeah. a case, you will have your data and you're running the debugging uh, scenario, but you still have your untrusted data. Yeah. Is that yeah, 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 it might be, you know. Yeah, but they would be. argue that you, in general, should then do this in an environment that is sandboxed and securely separated itself. So, I mean, I, I, th that was definitely interesting, but I personally would just remove the seccom call, be done with everything instead of going down this road of complexity. And uh, uh, well, 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 the complexity is only hide it un under under an option. It's not that complex. Like implementing BPF or uh, something like that would be more complex, right? This is the uh, I'm I'm basically ignoring the installation of filter. Mm -hmm. so that it doesn't get passed to the kernel. And I'm hiding it under this option. That was actually the simplest thing I could come up with that would be like a easy to implement and it will be genuinely useful, you know? Okay, thanks. It seems like faking the, the second. Uh, when you say removing uh, it, it is uh, what is in the picture. I'm not faking it so much more effort, but I would just get yeah, sure. rid of it and then I can use my bulk grind functionality like I want to use it. And security, is, in my mind, is not important. To get yeah, but it's inside file. The second piece is inside the file you're analyzing. Yeah, I know, but I decompile that anyway, and Still I can patch it. So you see that? Decompile, remove second, decompile without second. Well, that's probably harder than this, you know. Yeah, time, time is out. I'm sorry. I need to end, you know. Well, thanks. Yeah.